Good morning. I would invite you to join me as we read our scripture for today. I will be reading four different passages from Exodus chapters 21, 22, and 23. So you can flip quickly through your Bible or just follow along up on the screen. Exodus 21, verse 5. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. Exodus chapter 22, and the second part of verse 3. A thief must certainly make restitution, but if he has nothing, he must be sold to pay for his theft. Exodus chapter 3, verse 9. Do not oppress an alien. You yourselves know how it feels to be aliens because you were aliens in Egypt. And verse 19 at the end. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this precious time this morning we have with our brothers and sisters. I pray that your word and you would be honored and glorified this morning. Imprint on our hearts what you would have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Lara, for reading that. Some of y'all are wondering what was with those four verses. And uh, we're going to get to that in a second. But I remember in uh, middle school, uh, I had a great uh, youth leader named Bruce. And Bruce challenged us one week to begin reading the Bible from ye- uh, beginning to end in a year. And uh, so uh, I looked up to Bruce. And so I went, all right, I can try doing that. And I remember starting in Genesis, making my way to Exodus, getting to the Ten Commandments, like we studied as a church uh, last week, only to hit this very next section of scriptures that contained all these weird laws and all these sort of commands that made me think to myself, what on earth is happening? Or maybe I should ask, what in this universe is happening? There's talk of things like aliens and goats being boiled in their mother's milk and servants getting their ears pierced and, 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 and all sorts of other things like selling thieves into slavery. I mean, I had learned in Sunday school about the Ten Commandments and I had what I thought was a pretty good understanding of them then, but what was I supposed to do then about boiling goats and not oppressing aliens. This was a weird place to be. And it really is a weird place. I mean, as a church, we're going through this book of Exodus, and we kind of came out of the Ten Commandments, and we probably went, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm familiar with that, even if I didn't grow up in the church. I've heard pieces of that, and I, I, I can see the value of living into that. But then what What do I do with these next commands? And that was my question back then. And I think for most of us, it's still the question then. Like, what are we supposed to do with all these rules and laws? Like, why do these even exist? Like, why were they put into the Bible? And what do we do with them them now? I mean, if, if we as Christians are all about following Jesus, what do we do with all these laws that came before him? What would happen back then? There's a passage in Scripture that says all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so if we believe that, then we have to come back to something like this, as strange as it might be, and wrestle with it and ask ourselves, what can we learn from these commands? And my hope today is that we'll get a little bit closer then to being able to answer some of those questions and hopefully to be able to see things like what was just read in a little bit more of a sense of their context with an understanding of how it applies to us today. But in order to to get there, we have to go back and sort of ask ourselves questions about the context. Like, where is this found? What's going on? What's God doing as he speaks to his people? And, And what might these laws have meant to them back then 
So we know that Moses, at this point in the story, has led the Israelites out of 420 years of captivity as slaves in the nation of Egypt. They're now following God, following his presence in a pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, and they're, they're following him out into the wilderness. And he's now brought them to this place where he told Moses earlier they would come to know him and worship him. And as they, the people are camped around the bottom of Mount Sinai, God has called Moses to go up into the mountain to hear what he needs to bring back to the people. And so by the time we come then into chapters 21 to 24, Moses has received these Ten Commands that most of us are familiar with, but then a whole bunch of other laws comes after them. Ones particularly in these chapters dealing with slaves and property and family and social issues and a whole lot more things that make us sort of question. So the question is, what's the point then? Like, why did God give these laws to them back then? Well, I'd like to suggest to you a few reasons why God might have given the law to the Israelites in that circumstance. And the first one was to distinguish who Israel was, to help them sort of get a sense of identity. Again, God's in the midst of making a commitment to his people to shape them into what we might call the people of God. They are a people who are distinguished from everyone else as the people who are following the one true God. And so he's establishing around them a theocracy. Right? We're a democracy. We vote for who our rulers are. We pick them and install them to a certain degree. You might have a communist dictatorship where someone is in power and holds everything and makes all the decisions. But in this case, we have a theocracy that God is setting up, which is a government ruled by God himself. And so God's given them a law as his people because he's shaping their identity. He's shaping them in context, and he's helping them to understand how they can stand unique amongst all the other people. Remember, they have been with the Egyptians for 420 years, and to a degree, their culture has blended. They're about to, in their journeys through the wilderness and towards the promised land, going to interact with a whole bunch of other nations, particularly, most concerningly, the Canaanites, who will try to shift their understanding of how things should be, how they should live, and what it means to follow or worship God, or in their cases, many gods. And so these laws that we have are specifically to avoid sort of contamination or confusion with what's going on around them in context. For instance, you see that God immediately gives them very progressive laws that make them stand out in terms of slavery. I mean, the laws that we have here will eventually go on to be the, go from seed to flourishing in terms of the abolition of slavery that we know that happened not too long ago. Why does that happen? Well, it happens because God wants to do something with them. Remember, these are people who have lived as slaves their entire lives. And now God says, you know what? You have endured that. You've seen what it looks like to have slaves in Egypt. I don't want none of that. I actually want to see you not hold on to these slaves as servants that are meant to be exploited, but I want you to see them as laborers who are meant to be loved. And if you were to read the laws on slavery in the chapters that we're highlighting this week, you would see that God has given his people instruction to take these laborers who are perhaps indebted to their masters, but they are to live until a certain point, I think at a time called the year of Jubilee, in which case the slaves were to be set free and not just sent out on their own, but sent with supplies and giftings to represent blessing. The law distinguished Israel from Egypt. It also distinguished them from the Canaanites who they would encounter over and over for the next number of years. For instance, this is why we have the weird rules like you can't boil a goat in its mother's milk. 
If you were to actually flip back an entire other chapter to chapter 22, verse 19, you'd read another weird law, which is that you are not supposed to have relations with an animal. What on earth are you doing here, God? This is weird. Well, to us, this seems really weird. But in context, what we see is that there was a whole bunch of stuff to do with animals involved with the Canaanite religion. They had certain types of sacrifices they would make to their gods, which would involve things like cooking goats or having relations with animals. And so God wants to be very clear as this nation goes out into the wilderness, eventually to establish its own nation. He wants them to understand you're supposed to look a little bit different as one of my people. If you're in relationship with me, I want you to be distinguished from that which is taking place around you. And so while this gives them a sense of shape and identity, it also gives them guidance. I mean, again, they've been slaves for 420 years. What do they know about how to establish laws and society? How do they know what it means to to have a cultural identity if they and their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents have all been slaves and just done what is said? God's really generous in this. When we see these laws, sometimes people come and they're like, wow, that seems really restrictive. Like, it seems like God's just given a list of no-nos and things to keep people in line, but really, we actually see a generosity here. He's providing them guidance. I want to help you establish a way that you can go so that not only are you my distinguished people, but so you don't end up in troublesome situations, so you know how to navigate these social strange things that will come up, these difficult situations of injustice. How, how do we handle that? Here it is. I want to help you with that. And so God's actually being helpful to a people who are enslaved. He's not being a hindrance. So the law is helpful in those two ways. But the law is also helpful in a third way, which sometimes, again, we don't really like, but it makes sense when we begin to think about it. And that is that the law gives restraint. It gives us a reason to actually restrain ourselves in the way that we're living. One of the most famous passages of the Bible, which we often don't attribute to the Bible, is this. In Exodus 21, verse 23 to 25. But if there's serious injury, you're to take a life for an eye, a uh, life for a life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, a burn for a burn, a wound for a wound, or a bruise for a bruise. Now, we might not go around and say that, but we understand the, eye, the idea of an eye for an eye, that something should be repaid if something has been done unjustly. And so this seems a little bit harsh, but we, in a moment we'll see that God's actually coming to build towards something that is for our benefit. But what we can pick up is this idea that God's saying, I want you to be ready to do the time if you're going to commit the crime, right? He wants them to understand that there should be a sense of restraint. And we all know this. We all actually live this. Probably most of us experience this on our drive to church today. Who here, if you're honest, drove five or ten kilometers an hour over the speed limit? A whole bunch of us, right? Who here drove 150 over the speed limit to church? I'm really thankful no one put up their hand. No, but we, right? But the reality is we know that there is certain limits that we're willing to go because we're willing to potentially pay the fine. A lot of us live this way and we'll say, you know what, I can go five over because really the cop's not likely to pull me over. Or if I'm 10 over and I get a ticket, it's really not that bad. But we know we're not going to go 150 over because I can't afford that ticket. I can't afford to lose my license. I can't afford to have my car impounded. I need to show some restraint because I can't afford to pay the fine for the crime. And so I'm not going to do it. And so what happens here is God wants his people to understand that there is something that will happen if they do something wrong. There is consequence. God wants them to know, not only am I shaping you up 
to be someone not only am I trying to provide you con uh, guidance, but there will be consequence if you step outside of that. And you need to realize that I'll hold it in measure. When one thing happens, there's going to be an equal consequence. And there's a sense of balance. And so what we really see with the law as we go through it is that the law actually does much more than list a bunch of strange rules. It instead gives us insight into the heart of God. It gives us some sense of provision above of knowing who he is. It gave them an understanding of his identity. By reading the law, people could easily understand that this God who they were called to serve and love and worship and live for, well, he's actually a God who hates injustice. He's actually a God who is against oppression. He's actually a God that's for kindness and mercy and grace. He's a God that has a sense of justice beyond what we might get up to in our heated flare-ups when there needs to be some type of consequence. There's this sense of, of balance in who God is. That's good to know. That's important for us to see because if God was really lopsided one way or the other, we would have big issues, wouldn't we? If God was just a cosmic meanie, why would I want to worship him? If God let everyone get away with everything, there would just be this burning sense of injustice. In the law, God reveals then that he has both aspects. That there's a wholeness, a completeness to who he is. And he wants those who follow him to line up to that. To live their best into that. As God says, I want you to be a distinct people. I want you to live not with your own identity, but with my identity. So these laws reveal that God has a heart for the broken, the downtrodden, the fragile, that he'll uphold justice, he'll be progressive in the places that society needs to move forward, he'll be restrictive in the places where society needs to be restrained, and in all of that, there's a lot of goodness. Now, when we understand that context, when we understand sort of what God's doing there, then it's easy for us to go, okay, well, the law was for a specific people at a specific moment. I mean, we see that there's cultural laws, that there's ceremonial laws in here that have to do with religion. We see that there's moral laws that are in here. There's some interplay and interweaving of all those things. And if it's good to reveal God's heart, that's great, but how does it interact with us? Well, one of the great things about the law is not only does it reveal God's heart, but it reveals ours. We're going to see this take place over the next number of weeks as we continue to study. But if we were to read Exodus 24, which I'm hoping you all did this week because we put it out there on Thursday in the newsletter. But as we begin in Exodus 24, we read that after Moses shared all these laws with the people, and as he asked them to commit to living in this way, he did something. He sprinkled the blood of a bull upon the people. Now, that's really gross. I mean, none of us would want to be there and involved in that. But what there was was the symbolism that there's a sacrifice. There's a payment that needs to take place. And this would help prepare the people for an understanding that there would need to be blood shed for them time and time again. The old covenant work, the old promise that God had given with law and the ability to repay God, worked to a certain degree, but there was a problem. The imperfection of people. The imperfection of people would lead us to see that even right after this moment, where the people would go with a new sense of national identity and guidance and understanding into the heart of God as God was up on the mountain with their leaders as they were supposed to be down there worshiping him after they just made a commitment, they would go because they didn't know what was going on and build a golden calf. 
They are going to go, as we'll study in two weeks' time here, and build an idol which they will then worship, and God will have to humble them. One of the great things about the law is it reveals just how far off we are of having the same sort of heart of God, of having the same sort of understanding and identity and judgment, but also freedom to give mercy and grace. And so we recognize that there's a need for more to this covenant. Thankfully, God, out of that heart of justice, but kindness, also decided that he would send his son to fulfill this covenant and establish a new one. We read about this all in the sense of the Sermon on the Mount. I love the Sermon on the Mount. It's not only Jesus' greatest teaching, but it gives us uh, an amazing ability to see how all this works together in our day and age. We live on this side of Jesus and the cross, and as Christians, we know that we're supposed to follow him, but it, we wonder, right? We wonder, what do we do with all the rest? And in it, Jesus gives some explanation. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 18, he says, Don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Is heaven still there? Yeah. Are we all still standing and or sitting and spinning on this orb we call earth? Yeah. So what's happening? Where are we? We're in the midst of Jesus fulfilling what the law was all about. We see that Jesus started all of this on the cross. Jesus accomplished the main purpose of his presence on earth when he came to pay a permanent payment for the sins we keep on sinning. The law tells us that everyone has done evil, and because of that, we deserve an eye for an eye punishment. The problem is our sin is more than taking out the eye of someone else, but it's about bringing evil and death into the world and so God says because you have brought evil and death evil must be taken care of and death must come scripture says the wages or the debt of sin is death but the good news is that verse goes on and says but the gift of God is new life through Jesus Christ because of our sin we deserve death but because of Jesus we gain life. Jesus came to be the one who would never stray from God's law, who would understand exactly what God's heart is because he is God. And so he then was able to die in the place of all who had sinned, who had gone against the law. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, we read, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness, we might become right with God. So you know, the first thing that we should do when we come to these and wonder what we should do with all these laws is we should be brought to a place of thankfulness, of gratefulness. We should be thankful that because Jesus took the penalty of death, we no longer have to. I am really thankful as a pastor that on Sunday morning I don't have to hop in the baptismal and slaughter a bull so that we can burn it while the blood gets sprinkled on all of you And then we can go and have to go do more work until we come back again next week and do it all again. This is something to be thankful for. We don't have to live inside of that mucky, filthy consequence of sin. Instead, the sacrifice has already been played. Jesus has already poured out his blood. And because of that, the consequence of sin is gone. If we put our faith and trust in him. If we commit to following him the best we can. So what does that mean then? Does it mean we should then just be thankful and skip over this section of the Bible? No. I mean, the Apostle Paul in Romans writes this. He says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, 
we might have hope. There's an endurance that takes place here. There's an ongoingness that takes place here. Yes, is it perhaps different because Jesus has come? Yes. Paul will later go on, and uh, earlier go on, actually. He says this before that in Romans. In Romans 7, 6, he said, But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law. So when we come to faith in Jesus, we're released from the law and the consequence of it so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. As followers of Jesus, the goal isn't to live a life trying to avoid certain things while we do the right list of others, The way we are to live, then, is in the way of the heart of God. We're supposed to live in the way of his spirit, meaning that we're supposed to look at the law and understand the heart of God and live into it. Now, does that mean we're going to follow it literally in every sense? Well, no. We're going to grow in it. We're going to learn to follow it in the way that the Holy Spirit helps us to understand. To illustrate this, let me give you uh, an illustration that I took from an author of a book I read this week. He explained that this is all like growing up from children to being adults who live on our own. When you're a child, most, or when you were a child, most likely, there was a time in your life where you would get sick of dinner. And you would be done sitting at the table. Now, I don't know about you, but in my house, that didn't mean I could get up and run around and do whatever I want. It meant that I might want to do that, but my parents would always tell me there's something you have to do first. Thank you for dinner. May I be excused? Yes, you may. Can you take your dishes to the sink? Yeah, okay, so... You know, I didn't always do that. My parents sometimes made me sit at the table, sometimes not. And what was happening in that situation? My parents were teaching me something. They were teaching me a life lesson. They weren't teaching me that I would do it that way forever. I've gone on to live away from my parents longer than I lived with them. And nowadays, I don't call mom and dad when I'm at the dinner table and say, I'm all done, mom and dad. Can I get up from the table? Maybe I'll try that this week. But no, no, we don't do that. Because why? Well, one, I'm living differently, but at the same time, I have learned the principle that takes place. I've learned that doing that is no longer necessarily relevant, but the principle is. The principle, which is to be considerate of others, to learn to read a situation to see if this might be an appropriate time for me to leave the situation. In doing that, my parents taught me the heart that I was to have for other people, especially if I was going to share a meal with them. In the same way, this is what Jesus sort of does through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus took the law and he said, you've been taught to sit at the table and go a certain way, but now what I want you to do is consider the matters of the heart. It's not that we're free from doing it, to do whatever we want. It's that God has allowed us to graduate into another phase where we live with his spirit. Take, for example, how Jesus expands on the law. We see this in Matthew 5, 21 to 24. He says, you have heard it said to people long ago, you shall not murder, right? Ten commandment. Anyone who's murders will be subject to, to judgment, right? We, we know this. We've seen this in the law. We understand that God wants a sense of balance. We're seeing the same things that are tied in to, to the law here. He says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. It's not just about murder. It's about your heart towards other people. He's going to go on and actually say, I don't even want you to call someone a fool, Because if you did that, you're in danger of the very fires of hell. In fact, if you were to even come to church with a level of anger, he says, if you were to bring an offering to the altar, I would want you to stop what you're doing before you give your gift to go and make amends. He goes on shortly after this, 
You've heard it said that I don't want you to commit adultery. But I don't even want you to look lustfully at another man or woman, someone outside of your marriage bed. Jesus wants us to understand that following him and being a person of God in our day and age is about living in the Spirit, about identifying with the heart of God and living into that. It's not about a list of yeses and nos, though sometimes there will be that, but it's about instead considering how every situation lives up to the greatest commandment. Right? Jesus was quizzed on this. Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then the, first is, uh, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He then goes on to say, Everything that you've learned, all those laws, all those commands, they all hang on those two things. Do we love God with everything? Am I loving my neighbor as I should love myself? Am I living in the way of God's spirit? You can go to Galatians chapter 5, see the fruit of the spirit. Patience, joy, love, forbearance, kindness, goodness, self-control. If these things aren't being produced in my life, doesn't matter if I'm even living up to the laws of the Old Testament. I'm not living in the way of God's Spirit. I'm not experiencing what the Holy Spirit wants for me in my life. So as we ask this question, what does this law mean? Should I follow it? Well, the question is, yes, you should always follow the heart of the law and live with an understanding of how the Spirit calls you to do that. Does that mean it's going to look the exact same day in and day out? Well, probably no. We don't live in the same day and age. I mean, none of us own slaves. We're not going to go pierce their ear on a door. But what we can understand is that if someone comes to us who works for us, we're supposed to do the best we can by them. And if they try their best and they want to live and learn from us, we keep committed to them. We live in a day where women and children have much better rights than they did back then. So what we do is we take the heart of the laws and we understand how we're supposed to treat the people in our society who are oppressed and considered less than. We will sometimes step into those things that are morally right and we'll understand that God has never changed even then but we also need to live into the heart of the Spirit and what God might call us to. And the reality is that that is a much more serious and significant way of living. Living into the heart of the law is way harder than those commands. But we strive for it and we do it because we know his love and with his grace. We know that he's paid for every problem and every time we've walked away from his commands. And so as we read these scriptures, as you study them hopefully on your own, I encourage you to to, to look into the law. Go ahead and, and read this section of Exodus. Dive into Deuteronomy and Leviticus, these, these books that sometimes as followers of Jesus, we kind of leave them aside because they, they seem a little less exciting. But look into them and actually see the flourishing of what happens in them, how we see the heart of God and see how he caused his people to progress and have guidance and get to know him so that they could live in a better way. But as you do so, look to it through a lens of looking towards the cross of Jesus and look through the cross of Jesus to the fact that the Holy Spirit has come to live in your life to guide you in the way of Jesus. In that way, what we'll do is we'll begin to understand. We'll begin, begin to take the Old Testament laws as sort of a case law study to understand how we can apply the heart of God with some wisdom. Theologian John McKay says this, God prov- has provided paradigms and patterns which should allow the church still to this day to be able to understand and apply the basic ethical principles of God's kingdom in every situation.
We don't have to be discouraged as we go to these things because God's Holy Spirit is moving in our lives. He illuminates the passages if we're willing to look and he reveals to us who he is. Before we go today, what I'd love for us to do, we're going to sing a song again in just a moment, but I would love for you to just take an opportunity to reflect. Maybe it's an opportunity to reflect on how you've looked at the Old Testament or at his laws and consider how you've considered them. Maybe you've been really interested. Maybe it's something that you've put off on the side and, and kind of sloughed off, and it's an opportunity to come back and see that in a new way. Maybe you need time to reflect and just to thank God for his law and that he reveals his heart and that he invites us into a unique and distinct identity in him. Maybe you need to consider how much time you actually give to thinking about what the Holy Spirit can do as you look at God's text. So let's just take a moment to silently reflect for just a second and then I'll I'll, I'll pray for us, and then we'll close in response through worship. God, I thank you for your law. God, I admit that sometimes it's confusing, and sometimes it's feels like there, there should have been something different that you had said, but God, uh, in that I repent and I just ask uh, for the wisdom to acknowledge that you know what you're doing and that you know what you did as you gave those laws, not just to the people of Israel, but to the church today. And God, I just pray that as, as your followers, we would be people who would take that stuff seriously for our own benefit for the benefit of the church, for the world around us? Would we learn how to live through your spirit into the identity of Christ for your glory, Heavenly Father? Lord God, will we recognize the generosity of your sacrifice on the cross? Would we recognize your generosity that you come to live with us, Holy Spirit? We thank you for your forgiveness time and time again. God, I just pray we would be people who would be marked differently in our world, that we would live out of your heart, people who hold justice and kindness in each hand so that as we live, we live with a sense of balance. People who look back at those who are oppressed and we also lead forward to those who are, who are kind of leading the way. Lord God, will we have a balance in all those sense of our lives so that we would become more and more like you. So we thank you then for your law. We thank you for your guidance. Jesus, we thank you for clarifying these things. And Holy Spirit, we, I just pray that we would be sensitive to hearing what you have to say as we live life in the moments that you have for us next. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.